So what I thought I'd do real quick was um, give a very brief overview of the, the few projects that the FBI confiscated and that they were the most upset about and that was put into the transcripts both for indictment and then later they hoped to have put them in when if I had, had to go to trial, which I didn't. So this was the first one. This was a project we were working on, Marching Flag. And what we basically were wanting to do there was to call attention to <laughs> the illegal uh, use of germs, uh, again, by the United States. The United States was in clear violation of the Biological Weapons Act of 1972. And we just wanted to remind everybody why germ uh, weapons were made illegal to begin with. And the way we decided to do it was to reenact one of the very famous germ tests. It was a tactical weapons test at the Isle of Lewis. And it was done at the very end of the British germ warfare program. And they were pretty desperate by this point. They didn't know what they could really use it for. They just knew the Japanese were doing it, so they better be doing it too. And after their tests had failed and failed to be any kind of competent weapon, they finally thought what they could do was make it a ship-to-ship -ship tactical weapon. And they went out into the seas of the Isle of Lewis to test this out. Um, they set up a pontoon boat full of guinea pigs. And basically, they shot simulant at it first to see if they could get the germs to travel right. And when they thought they could, they shot actual anthrax and plague to see how it would work. And it didn't work very well. It worked really poorly. And that was kind of the end. The British did a few more experiments. But basically, they pulled the plug and said this is a very useless weapon. Um, the United States came to the same conclusion only much later in the late 60s, which is why there was a biological weapons treaty at all. And so you can see on ours, there's our, we set up our pontoon boat full of guinea pigs. And much like we did, we, tried, we used the same simulant and try to see if we could hit these guinea pigs with this particular variety of bacteria, only if we were using a safe kind. We never, we never <laughs> used the actual diseases. Um, and, our, and we completely failed at it, so it didn't work for us, whatever, you know, 50 years later, 60 years later, the weapons are still like total failures, and it's just an incredible waste of public money. And we were writing a book on this same topic, and so, as you might guess, the FBI finding out that that's what we were working on was none too keen. Um, they couldn't really stop the project. We still went along with that. They confiscated what they could. They took away all our bacteria, and they took away our microbiology lab. And they confiscated the manuscript we were working on. They took every copy of it. They found every one, so there was no backup. We had to start all over again to write that particular book. So that was the A part. Okay, if you can go to the next one under that, after marching flag. Free range grain. Free range grain, correct. All right, free range grain, they weren't happy about this either. Even though it was really a, a benign project, all we were really trying to talk about was what will happen when a few multinational corporations have control of the world's food supply, which they're well on the way to. And in order to make that more interesting to people, because that's a rather abstract political conversation that most people are not interested in having, um, we made the gesture of testing people's food to see if it was, well, in Europe, to see if it had genetically modified product in it or not. Um, theoretically, if it's not labeled in Europe uh, as having GMO, it shouldn't have any. And so we were we were doing these tests, and if the results were, and these are impressionistic, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. The results that we got in Holland, all the food was clean. Um, in Germany, it was about 50-50. And in Austria, which we went to because they're the most militant about no GMOs, everything we tested was contaminated. So it was it was an interesting <laughs> tour through Europe. Um, it's a worry. <laughs> That? It's very worrying. Yeah. Uh, well, just remember, there's no linkage yet between health problems and GMOs. I mean, most of the problems with genetically modified organisms are either ecological or political. 
And, you know, and that's what we really wanted to get through to people, in spite of the fact that what most folks are worried about is their health if they eat them. Um, but, you know, take America. It's a giant testing ground right now. For the past 20 years, almost every American eats GMOs every day. And so far, there hasn't been a health implosion. So, you know, I, I, like I said, I care much more thinking about Monsanto and, tr and control of the world's food supply than in eating a bowl of corn flakes that might have some GMO in it. Anyway, what the FBI really didn't like about this product uh, project wasn't as much the politics as it was people having their own labs. That just seemed a bit too empowering to them. It seemed like we were showing a little bit too much agency. And the belief that really only professionals should do this kind of thing, that amateur science was something that could only lead to trouble, and for the most part, amateur research probably should be equated with terrorism. So we had problems with this project. They, of course, confiscated everything from free range grains. We lost all our lab, everything. They took, all of, they took all of our enzymes, too. That was the part that really hurt, because the wetware for these projects are the most expensive thing. Um, reagents have to be one of the most expensive things on Earth um, for what you get. I, I mean, just, you know, a microliter can cost hundreds of dollars. So they had put that in and said, you know, who knows why we were using this microbiology lab and this molecular biology lab. We were probably up to no good. And the reason they thought that was the third project, if you go down to molecular revolution, or to contestational biology, Hopefully it's bright enough that you guys can see it there. Oh, looks good. And in this particular project, we did this as a provocation against Monsanto. Um, we took some of their seeds and basically looked for a way that if you were to spray the herbicide that pairs with that particular seed, Roundup Ready, so there's Roundup Ready seeds and Roundup Ready herbicide, if you use that, it would kill the plant, that the plant would not be immune. And um, the way we went about doing it was from changing the key trait, uh, that is the imported gene, which is a bacterial gene, and instead of letting it be a trait of adaptability, we attacked it as a trait of susceptibility. And by doing that, any herbicide that you make will not hurt any other plant, because no other plant has bacteria genes in them. So you could target Monsanto's plants specifically and not hurt any other plants or any endanger anything else in the general environment, including humans. And so we did find a chemical that worked pretty well, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is a, a vitamin D enzyme, so it's actually healthy for humans, but bad for the plant. And uh, between sunlight and the spray and the pyridoxal, it will definitely kill a Roundup Ready plant, and we were going to make that into defense kits for organic farmers who were having their crops impinged upon by the flying pollen of the GMOs. Needless to say, the FBI and Monsanto both were not crazy about this, and we, we did it at you know, a pretty well-known American institution, a Corcoran, and we advertised it, so we were in all the newspapers, and sure enough, um, you know, Monsanto sent its lawyers right away with a cease and desist order, and happily, uh, we did not comply, and the museum supported us, which was kind of shocking. We weren't really expecting that. Um, so it was non-compliance, but anyway, that got us on a very bad radar, and you know, you can, we've gone through it in reverse order, but now you can just send it forward and see how the cascade effect went in terms of the projects and why they were looking at us. Now that said, by way of introduction to the film, um, there was a lot of other things going on that partially just made me um, the wrong person at the wrong time. You know, I just wasn't in the right place. And in, in some ways, the fact that I got wrapped up in that FBI dragnet was partially um, due to just an arbitrary coincidence of my wife and CAE member Hope dying and being turned in by an emergency worker 
who called the FBI and said, hey, there's someone that has laboratory equipment. And at the time that that happened, um, it was the Bush administration, and the Bush administration was rewarding law enforcement by bringing in terrorism cases. That was the number one thing, because they wanted to prove domestic terrorism so they could continue with their various nefarious plans of injustice and, quote, preemptive justice. And that's why the United States had a very strong run for many, many years in the Bush administration, up to about 2006, 2007, of all these fake cases. I mean, just cases that clearly the people were not terrorists. But they were going to try and time for it, because if you were successful, it was the best way as a law enforcement agent or as a prosecutor to get a major promotion. That's what was really being rewarded. And <clears throat> this was particularly true in Buffalo, where the only successful case of domestic terrorism up to that time, the Lackawanna 6, had been prosecuted. So, you know, um, the Department of Justice and the FBI were really keen to arrest somebody as soon as they could. And I, unfortunately, was the test case for that. Um, unfortunately for them, they had no idea what kind of resources I could muster worldwide to mount a defense against what was clearly an unjust accusation. So, um, with that, I think we're running a little on time. We want to get you to the film as soon as possible, since that is the reason that we're all here tonight. Okay. Um, I hope you enjoy it, and at the end, I will come back and answer any questions you might have, or if there's anything you want clarification about. I'm happy to do it. Well, I mean, shockingly enough, it, it didn't change all that much. Because as, when the case happened, we were, and I think the movie, the film talks about this, or we talk about it in the film. We, we talk about are, uh, are, we, are we breaking up? No, no, it's fine. Okay, good. Um, the film talks about this, that we really were not going to back down. We really felt it was you know, a matter of social justice that we continue to do our work the same as we always had, that we didn't change our projects, that we completed the ones that we were working on. So, and, you know, we stood by that for four years. And then when we got through the, all of the problem and came out the other end and won our case, well, after that, we weren't ever going to really change. You know, we kind of thought that, hey, um, We've taken the worst of it now, and we're still the same. And so, yeah, I, we weren't gonna, we weren't going to shift very much. Mm -hmm. um, the the follow up question that usually comes with that is, you know, do you do work about the case? And we've done a little bit, especially when we thought I was going to go to trial. But for the most part, no. I mean, that's something that happened to us personally, and we see as very different from our practice. Yeah. And then other questions. Um, Melina, uh, okay, you come here. You come over here. So that's good. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know if we're becoming more radical, but we're certainly holding the line. It's it's easier right now than it was because you know the Bush administration being over and during the Bush time everything was answered with negativity and violence, right? So whether you know it was torture or wars or I mean, just one atrocity after another. The Obama is much more to the friendly side of authoritarianism. And so we kind of have to meet that with that same kind of um, friendliness, you know. Uh, it, it's to go up against that, that um, a kind of authoritarianism that stays latent and hidden, and that we just have this massive national security agency surveillance state, um, but one that is not trying to put everybody in jail, just trying to watch everybody. 
it's a different kind of strategy and kind of a more radicalized strategy like we would use against the Bush administration isn't really called for. This is, you know, much more a strategy now of, and, you know, I think WikiLeaks and, and Snowden kind of set the pace. Exposure is our best tactic. And, you know, that's not the most radical gesture. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. There's a, there's a question. Would you like to come over here? Oh. Uh, okay. He's got to use a microphone. It doesn't work. Doesn't work. The microphone. Oh, there we go. Yeah. He's coming over here. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> um, surveillance like we have under the Obama state, we've always had that. You know, uh, we've, been, <laughs> we've been watched by various authorities for well over a decade now. So um, it's, it's just more people now are waking up to the fact that it's happening to them as well, particularly in terms of big data. So, no, um, it's, it's, it's not a problem for us. I, you know, we basically do our work under the assumption that everything we do is being launched. And, and we proceed from there. We have good lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have any other question? <laughs> any other question? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> well, pleasure. Lane? So, I mean, it was, it was a struggle for um, a little while, but... <laughs> You know, luckily, in terms of skill base, you know, we're all replaceable, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, Hope was a fantastic editor. We couldn't have asked for better, but we have a really good one again now, Lisa Summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's she's doing an incredible job. She's um, a very good gateway for our work and our publications and to the public. She's, you know, stepped right into some very big shoes and is filling them quite nicely. So it's... A Okay. I have a comment, though, before we Please. go, if I may make one. Of course. And, and I, I just wanted to say that, you know, a lot of the film that you saw is um, not the best uh, in terms of its facticity. What Lynn was doing when she made that film was to try and really capture the tone, the emotional tone of the moment, of which she did an excellent job. I mean, she replicated it almost perfectly. Um, but many of the things that happened in the film didn't actually happen. I mean, she's playing with the story, and she was also using um, a conglomeration of events that not only had happened to me, but it happened to her. And the part about the students not wanting to help, that was something that happened to her when she got in trouble at her university. In my case, my students were great. They totally rallied, and they did everything that they could. They did fundraisers, they did teach-ins, they went to protests. Uh, they organized events. They organized. I, I couldn't have asked for more support from my students. So they weren't hesitant at all. They jumped right in and got right into the fight. Uh, so, you know, I, I always kind of say that at the end because I don't want my students to take a bad rap like they were scared to get politically involved. They were anything but that. It, well, there's no doubt that it did. I mean, you know, the net has been a godsend for, for organizing. Now, at the same time, it also has expanded the surveillance state beyond our wildest dreams. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, I, you know, the net made the distribution of everything we had to say, gave us this incredible, decentralized, unstoppable mouthpiece that couldn't be censored. So not only could we get everything we needed to say out globally and get it out quickly, it was unstoppable. And in the end, 
I think, you know, we had a far better public relations team than the Department of Justice did. And globally, they just got pounded. Uh, you know, they're still hurting from it to this day. Um, the FBI is still having um, kind of meetings with bio-amateur scientists apologizing and saying, you know, please be nice, work with us, we're not the enemy, even though that's all a lie. But a lot of people tend to believe them. And the reason that they're doing it is from what they call Kurtzgate. They understand that their reputation was seriously hurt during this case. And like I said, to this day, they're making up for it. And the net was, to a great degree, the medium that allowed us to do that. Yeah.